Well, hello and welcome to the session, everyone. My name is Batul Alamda and I'm your tech host for this session. I am here to help you. If you have any issues, just type them in the chat box and I'll help you out. There's a few, few instructions from my side to make this session go with ease. Please make sure to stay muted if you aren't talking. And for harvesting purposes, we'll be recording the session. So do let me know if you have any issues with that. Our today's session uh, is about how AI is going to affect education. And our speaker today is Ron Berlinski. He's the founder of Curiosity Learning, an online learning platform to spark curiosity and allow learners to learn anything that they are curious about in a motivating and cooperative environment. He believes being intrinsically motivated to learn is the best way to be prepared for the future. And school takes that way from people. Now he's doing all he can to change that. Let's dive deeper into today's session. The floor is all yours. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Um, so like Patil said, my name is Ron. Uh, I'm going to be facilitating this session. And this doesn't mean that I'm going to be giving you information. This is going to be uh, that I'm going to make sure everything runs smoothly, because really what I want is to hear your thoughts, uh, is to ask questions and to have this session to be full of question marks rather than exclamation marks. Um, so to start off, I wanted to do a little game to kind of see where people are. Um, so I'm going to quickly, if people have a camera, then this is the time to use it. If you don't, you can also just raise your hand. I'm going to say a statement. And then if you agree, then you can turn your camera on. And if you disagree, then you can leave it off. Okay. So we'll start with that. Everyone's off. And I'll say a statement. So the first statement is, Turn it off a little. The first statement is, I get the feeling that I understand what AI is. Okay. Quite a bit of people. That's good. You can turn it off. The next one is, I think that AI gives reliable information. Okay, turn it back off. I think AI should be allowed in schools. Okay. So we're all agreeing on that one, or most of us, which is, uh, firstly, I'm happy to see that, but I'm also interested to hear why, because the discussions that I had with a lot of people, many people, some people think it's bad, some people think, you can leave it on your cameras, uh, it's done. Um, leave your camera on. Um, some people think it's, it should be, and some people think it shouldn't. Um, and I think also understanding what it really is, and this is something we can elaborate and talk more about during the session, can help understand if it should be in the system or it should be uh, taught with it or being banned. So what we're going to do to get started is a bit of a self-reflection, is a bit of, because I think, a session really impacts if you know where you are now in your thoughts and then after our discussion kind of reflect see where you started and i think that can really make a perspective so if everyone has a pen and a paper and i'll put on some music and then just like one two minutes on how, what your, your understanding on on what ai is why you think it should or shouldn't be used in school um essentially that a short thing just or in school or in education or in learning your thoughts on that and i'm going to put on some background music so i hope you guys that was enough time to think a little bit on on where you currently stand and we'll look at it afterwards but this is now where i want to kind of open it up um and really hear from you on your thoughts i think to, to really understand for this uh, discussion to go well, we need to understand uh, first what we're talking about. So I'm gonna throw out the question of what is AI? And then whoever feels comfortable unmuting and explaining their thoughts on, or their explanation on what, um, I think we're all kind of thinking of the same thing. I'll specify like generative AI. 
So like ChatGPT, um, Bing, that type of stuff. That that aspect of it. Yeah. So whoever wants to unmute and we'll start the discussion. So it, it doesn't have to come from me or just raise your hand or just unmute and speak. Go for it. So for me, it, it's interesting since January, obviously, that's when it seemed to hit, hit our consciousness in a very big way. Um, I teach at a university and obviously it, it freaked out so many instructors at, at there because of that one statement that a kid made, I think, in one of the articles that he had his homework or whatever it was done by AI and told his classmates that they were stupid for not doing it. You know, so so I I, I think that started, but you know, my, my sense is, and I use it quite a bit, and I get, even get my students, I teach doctoral students to utilize it. It it's machine language. You know, it's like um, when Jeopardy, what who was a Ken Jenkins got beat by Watson on that. That to me was sort of the beginning of what we're going to know about it. But, you know, it, it's, I see it as a very valuable tool. It, it helps you to, to develop questions to get deeper into it. That's what I'm discovering for myself, that it, it's forcing me to do that. Um, but then again, there's a lot of dangers. I don't know if you've seen that, that video that's out uh, on YouTube uh, about the AI dilemma which shows some of the dark sides of it. So it's stuff that we have to think about. My only concern is, um, as I think back in 2019, uh, Shahana uh, Zubroff wrote that book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And that's the thing that scares me about it because it's all these corporations developing this and it's almost a, a war among them to get the most subscribers to make the most money. So that's where I am with it. Thank you for sharing, Sean. Does anyone else want to jump in? What, what, in, what, what is it really? Like, how does it work? Who knows? Or who thinks, has ideas? Go for it. I think in my perspective, it's nothing but simulating, simulating human intelligence in more technical terms. I think that's what I learned in a book. And ever since then, I've just been referring to it as nothing but a simulation of human mind. So it's more like a complex and more defined version, but not as uh, not as great as doing imagination stuff, like not as cool, not as not as good as curating good stuff like humans can. It's an open discussion, so I'm, 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 I, I prefer not to call on people. So if you have something to say, just then you raise your hand, just unmute and you can speak, yeah? I think, I mean, the point that was said earlier by John about um, who owns it is, is very, very crucial. As was, I don't know how many people here were in the discussion we had yesterday, um, but we were given a kind of two roots scenario between heaven and hell and um, as a private tool of, of, of very powerful corporations. Um, and, it, and that is definitely going in the hell direction. So there's that argument, which I think is pretty clear to anyone, but 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 really does does you know does the world really want to further increase inequality and and you know the centralization of power and wealth? But um I would kind of take it a step further in that most of a lot of this conference has been about the need to rediscover ourselves as humans if we wish to know how to educate ourselves let alone anyone else uh, and this, you know it's been put in the context of how western science with its separation of, from what it's studying its dualism and so forth is essentially um become a busted flush which is an argument i I, can, I agree with that doesn't mean to say everything in western science is is wrong it clearly isn't but it's 
it as 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 a, as a direction. Um, I thought the whole purpose of this conference was to to find new direction, which was going towards a better understanding of humanity. And uh, I do not think that using uh, data from a very limited section of of of, of humanity, because there's more data about commerce than there is about anything else. There's more data about white men than there are about Peruvian peasants. There's more uh, and women. There's, you know, there's, it, it is a. It's taking us in a direct. So, so, what is generating? What what is where it is being generated from? Is a very limited pool of of what the world knows, and in fact, it's reinforcing this uh, technocratic approach to life, which I I I think many other people in this conference are, are not happy with. Or Sierra Salad, does anyone uh, want to respond on that? Well, maybe maybe not respond, but um, I I I, I studied advertisement, and recently I saw an experiment of someone that was um, creating, asking the AI to create um, uh, a brand. So the idea of this brand was to save the world. And this AI was creating like all these um, slogans and it was creating some pictures also like what could do best for different audiences. And at the end of the day, this was such a, a, a news that many brands wanted to enter and to to talk with this AI, but not because it was trying to save the world, because it was made by an AI. So that was like the hook, not the intention, but who or what was making this campaign. And it was amazing because many brands were trying to put their logo with this other one and i was like oh so maybe we're just creating content without sense but it is part of the of the media and part of this huge way of having a lot of things to see during the day that we have right now in our cell phones or yes yeah, there's like a lot of information well but that is something that i approve uh, from the place that I approach AA, like more from this, how can we use it? Because I don't think that it, it can change the interaction that we have. The um, Like creating this conference is not like we're going to create this conference with AA. It's like human people is behind this creation. Maybe we can use it like a tool and select what we like or what we want. but relationships at the end of the day is for at least for me what what matters most and i pass it i want to i have a question on that if you're saying that at the end of the day the humans are making the choice but if we keep asking and relying on asking the ai is it still our choice yeah so i think <laughs> I mean, Sorry. Yeah. 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 Go. I also feel AI is a tool, so it depends on how we use it. So, if you are going to pick up any power tool and expect that power tool to do the job for you, you're going to end up with damage. If you're going to learn how to use that tool appropriately you're going to end up being able to create more powerfully. If you're going to turn that tool into a weapon, you're going to combine the two and create intentional damage that is more powerful than you could create without that tool. So I think it really depends on how we use it. And that's also where um, I think it's very important that 
as we've, you know, other people have said, it doesn't become privatized to a small number of people who can then weaponize it only. And I think that the more the children play with it, the more they find out how to use it as a creative tool um, and how to help evolve it so that it can be used more effectively for what we want to use it. But yeah, to answer your question, um, we can't rely on it. That's just silly. I think that's mystifying what it is. Um, that's giving it more power than it has. It's, it's our tool. <laughs> you know, it's like I can't, I'm just thinking, you know, back, I'm quite old. So, you know, airbrushes were this big revolution in art and, and everyone had this impression that you're not really making art because you're using this airbrush, right? But you can't just point an airbrush at a paper and you get this beautiful effect. You have to learn to master it. And, and the effects you get will depend on how much you master it. So I'm really interested, last thing to say, um, I, I'm watching a number of people of different ages um, create filters and lens modes and kind of um, special instructions to give to chat GPT that completely change its output. And those are the people who are learning to, to surf this and ride this and put the reins on this thing. It's great. Is it okay if I jump in? <laughs> I com I completely agree with you. Um, and I think, so I'm, I'm a teacher. I teach uh, middle school and high school. And I think um, it definitely is a digital tool. And I think it also depends how we wield this tool. And I think, especially in education, it's essential that um, we included um, and accepted that this is just progress that we're seeing and that we're being involved in and that it's part of the media literacy that we have with so many other things and we have to teach the kids or everybody how to wield this tool properly and how this tool is not going to be something negative but then also see it as something critical and seeing what positive things we might be able to do with this digital tool. You know, Mike uh, hey, stimulated. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I just I wanna... just want to add <laughs> because this is such a big topic, and and the reason location. So, is there are, are you going to frame it in a way so that way we can really point at it? Otherwise, if we're going to start out like this, and this this is like a five hour conversation <laughs> easily. Yeah, yeah. I um, wanted to first start open, and then I'm going to uh, have a really direct prompt and separate us into two groups. And uh, even if you don't agree with it, try to argue why I think it could uh, help form an argument and a uh, better opinion. Does that make sense? So I'm just waiting for, we'll just wrap this one up, and then we're going to make it a more direct prompt, okay? So I, I just said something, Mike stimulated something for me. So I just jumped on chat AI and I was asking it about indigenous thinking in terms of the process. And, and I asked it how, you know, how does indigenous thinking and its framework for asking questions? And it said, you know, the use of indigenous thinking, you know, answering questions is emerging area of research and practice. However, some of the efforts are being made to incorporate indigenous uh, ways of knowing into the system, talks about some of the research that AI researchers are doing. Then I asked it for examples and, you know, it said AI is being incorporated, you know, into the indigenous thinking through language processing, cultural preservation, environmental monitoring and community engagement. Now it talks more about those, but, you know, it's kind of interesting, like I said, you know, the, the thing I'm trying trying to get get at least my students to begin to understand is that that the way in which you ask the questions has a lot to do with how it responds. So the deeper and, you know, like I'll ask it like 10 different questions around indigenous thinking just to see how how it's developing, because that's how I'm going to use this word. It learns in relationship to machine learning. So I think, yeah, it might just stimulate me to think about that because of the essence of what this, this program is about. And, you know, it's about, you know, integrating indigenous thinking. So the question is, how does AI help us to explore that question? Yeah. I think, Nikolaus, you wanted to, to add, on, add something? 
Well, yeah, there's just so much in there, but uh, you you ask the question if it's still the human that takes uh, the decision, uh, like before, and to a degree it is, but to another degree, if we rely on the information that gets fed to us by the AI, um, it's only part of us that takes the decision because we rely on the information that is being fed to us. And that's a decision, quote unquote, that the AI, the AI takes and not us. So we just make the decision to pick whatever we want from the information we get fed. And just real short, like how works AI? Um, these language models, as far as I understand it, they um, have an algorithm that just checks for what would the most, um, what's the word, um, the most probable answer be onto the question. So it's not about understanding. But then I saw a video where they compared ChatGPT to GPT-4. So ChatGPT being 3.5, right? And they had this question of, you go into a room with 100 murderers and you kill one. How many murderers are left in the room? And ChatGPT would say 99, but GPT-4 uh, checked that it is a riddle. And since you murdered one, it's still 100. And this is kind of puzzling to me because for me, that feels like there is a need for understanding in there. I can't see how the algorithm could get to that answer. So, yeah. yeah. And also, uh, another thing to think about is how we handle a tool makes it good or bad. That kind of almost says tech is value agnostics. And there's uh, a lot of good content from Daniel Schmachtenberger, for those who know him, about that issue that tech is not value agnostics. It's uh, way too much to go into it, but who is interested, maybe want to check out that. If you can put it in the chat after, that would be great. Um, awesome. So I think we kind of got an idea of, of, of what it's about, how it works. Now, the question that this discussion, uh, I'm really interested in is in, um, should it be allowed in schools? Should schools be using it? Because I already know that there are already places that put a ban on it, that it's not allowed within the school Wi-Fi to use chat GPT. Um, and I have I have a feeling, the fact that we're all here to reimagine education, that we all have a very similar viewpoint. Um, and I think that's dangerous because that means we're all just echoing each other's ideas. So what I want to try is we'll, we'll start off by, I want to hear actually your thoughts. And then what we'll do is I want to all, all, all to pretend that we think it shouldn't that we think that it shouldn't be in schools and then see if where what arguments we get to to kind of understand for us to be able to to say our points we need to understand what the other people think so i think that could help with that but let's start off with um what are your thoughts on it should it be allowed in schools if if really what we're doing is does it count as plagiarism ai is it your own work can you only use it for brainstorming is it the same thing as a calculator? Can it be allowed in schools? What are your thoughts on that? I think if we're going to be imagining, I think it is imagine that it's going to do something for us good in school. Let's focus on what it can do for us good in school. And then if, if, if we run out of time on that, which I doubt, then uh, we can go on why it's not good in school. 
since we're imagining. Because not wanting to do it is not much of imagining. I'm curious, are we talking about a specific uh, age group or um, type of school? Yeah, that's a huge topic. I think Brandon's uh, point about critical thinking is a big one that like, depending on you know where you are in your process of de developing your own critical thinking, you know, it can either be a, a really harmful crutch or a really valuable tool. Can you, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so I think like, you know, a, a picture myself, you know, I'm not an educator, so I mainly have my own experience to go off of, but like I think of myself in like early high school and like if I discover this then like, yeah, it would have been a field day of like plagiarism and trying to like minimize, you know, the actual thinking that I had to do in favor of, you know, things that could be automatically generated. But, you know, now when I use it in my work, I like, you know, think about, okay, what are the things that's really good at? Like, how can it be inspiration that I can then adapt? Um, so it's like, I see it being really important to be introduced with sort of context of like, you know, when it's valuable and like when you need to be like cautious of sort of it replacing your own thinking. Um, I would think the question, would we want to allow it in schools or not is futile even because it's not going to go away. How, how are you going to try to keep it out of there? There is no chance. So uh, instead of talking about do we want it or not, is the question should be how do we use it as best as possible? I think to play devil's advocate, exactly the opposite of what I was saying in the beginning. Uh, I think the case for banning AI in schools it would be partially around the incentive structures and the like model and function of modern education. Right? Modern, Amer at least me living in the US, uh, modern education hinges heavily on delivery of knowledge and regurgitation of knowledge. And that being the primary function AI would basically make all of that obsolete. And in making all of that obsolete, therefore it would make teachers obsolete. And so just thinking it from an economic perspective, it would put basically the vast majority of teachers out of work. So it would cause like massive, I think, social and financial unrest by complete, like fully unleashing AI un on unrestricted to students in a high school program, for example. Um, so I think one argument uh, in terms of keeping the status quo, whether that's good or bad is a completely different question. I think maintaining, making sure that things don't change too quickly, uh, not allowing AI would kind of serve that particular function. Even though philosophically, I think AI is incredibly powerful. I think that would be one, what I've just mentioned, might be one argument for not allowing it in schools or only allowing it in a very specific or limited function. So I just want to comment on that because I think that it doesn't make all of this stuff obsolete. It shines a light on the fact that all of this is obsolete. And I think that's extremely useful. And I think it's time that the world woke up to the fact that this regurgitation of knowledge has been a waste of time for a long time already. And um, I hope the kids use AI enough, fast enough for teachers to have to change the way they engage and for the system to stop using teachers the way that they use them because most of the teachers are not enjoying it. And maybe if we could get away from this delivery of information and regurgitation of information waste of time, we could actually have educators and kids relating, which could be awesome. I also have a case study with working with a group of uh, homeschool or self-directed learning kids where I incorporated that they can use AI in our program. And what would they use it for? And if they came up with something really good, then I would use it. And within like uh, two or three days of playing with it, 
uh, a kid came back and pretty much says that he can not only use AI to create the curriculum that he wants to teach that he knows nothing about, but be, at the end of it, map out a book and produce a book with beautiful illustration where he can fact check it and give us academic articles on it. And uh, he technically wouldn't need anybody to teach him learning, but he can use AI to pretty much like triangulate data so that way he can give him the best, best answer for, for his learning. And he has an outcome at the end of the day with it. So then the other kids kind of went on it. And then they said, yeah, then they can sell the book and he can make money. So then his education, his self-directed learning would produce an income and make money. And, and so, you know, when you hear stuff like that, and these are like 14, 15 year old kids, you know, it, it, you know, I can discount it all I want thinking, okay, I might be out of a job and I'm technically useless to you then. Uh, but from, an, from, a, from a teacher who my concern is not about my job, my concern is about pushing the limits because I've always taught technology. Uh, uh, I came out of the original JavaSoft team. Uh, so we look at technology as an enabler and if it could push them to that level of thinking and empowerment, shoot, I'm happy to be out of a job, but I need to go find something else to do. If it's going to push them to be at that level of, of, of uh, outcome and, and innovation and, re, and, and, uh, and reproduction, so uh, regeneration. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I just, uh, I think the limitation will be us, uh, not, not the tool and not for learning. Uh, us, I mean teachers. Yeah, I, I agree with that because, you know, I, I have 39 years experience in the K-12 environment. I've been superintendent of schools. I've seen all that stuff. I'm now 16 years at university level, you know, trying to nurture the development of the next, you know, generation of, of leaders coming into schools. And what I look at AI, and I, and I get my students to look at this, but I also think about my own journey with technology over many years. And I worked out of a governor's office in, in one of the states trying to deal with in the 90s, what are we supposed to do with this thing called the internet in terms of learning? <laughs> so the question to me is, is really is, 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 you know, AI can, you know, the fear is AI is gonna wipe out a lot of jobs, not just teachers. So whether that's true or not, who, who knows? The, 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 the bigger issue for me is, is what, what potential does it have for us to re-image what schools in a community need to look like? You know, and 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 I'm and actually I I I don't even want to use the word school. I want to say how does it re how does it help us to re-image what learning environments within a community can look like? For example, if we begin to look at the community as the classroom. What potential does that give us? We're not trying to solve a problem. We're trying to, you know, create a potential because of what this can do. And that's where the creative, I think, you know, ingenuity of the educators and community together can begin to explore how to do this. That to me is, the, is a critical, critical issue that it's shifting our mindset. That's where the indigenous way of thinking, which, you know, from my point of view is we're all indigenous on this planet Earth. Question is, how do we reconnect to it and how do we utilize this to, to, to create the next generation of structures, if you want to use that word, for what <laughs> and how we nurture human development? Sorry, I, I'm going to, I see there's no audio. So everybody just pitches in. So I'm Michelle and as a a lecturer, a teacher at a university. Um, yeah, so I, I, I was in the, because I'm basically technophobe and use it for my basic necessities. So, um, 
and to hear about what this chat GPT is about and uh, and it is causing I guess a lot of discussion at the university particularly around plagiarism and writing essays etc et and so yeah I, I'm just and I'm just wondering if um, I don't know if we're losing the plot here in this discussion a bit and um, so you know so so there are those at the university that some of my colleagues that have been teaching the same curricula for the last 10 years and shift questions and ensure a student can go and, you know, put in, uh, you know, what's the definition of sustainable development from the Brunton Commission, da, 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 and, you know, the thing will give the answers. But, but this is, uh, there's been a, a debates about um, assessments in university, you know, how do you get students to think? How do you get students to be more reflexive? Um, and also so that in general, they, you know, won't be able to plagiarize. So, so I'm just wondering um, also questions about technology. We seem to be all this on the side of say, this thing's come out, we must all accept it because it's here. Um, you know, how can it be useful or not useful? Um, and I'm, it's also for me general questions about technology and what is enough, what do we need? Um, and I, I'm just not hearing that in this conversation. And I know it's here, but um, but it's, you know, do we all have to sort of, I don't know, suddenly embrace it? Um, and when does it, and how do we go back to the big questions of rethinking um, the pen octagon of the factory school, the factory university, and you know how we live, learn uh, differently. So, yes, I, 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 I just don't hear a deeper, I don't know, critical voice in this space at the moment. I would love to. Can I answer yours? I'm. It's a bit. I don't know if it's going to be possible for the little one, but I, yeah, I just think it's. It's fascinating because I spend. Okay, I'm gonna chip in later. She's a bit too sad now. It's just it was from a tech perspective because I spent like five years in a tech startup working with specifically computer vision and uh, and a lot of time at Singularity University. I don't know if you're familiar with Kurtzwill and kind of you know his way of viewing AI and. I, I'm deeply afraid of it because it's here, right? It's it is here, and I think it's it's really interesting for um, when we somebody mentioned, you know, the teachers. I think five years ago I was in China, and there's a Chinese uh, startup that raised like hundred million back then uh, called Squirrel, which basically wanted to replace the teacher with an AI, right? And that was five years ago. So we're, you know, this was ages ago. And I remember at an ethics conference in Europe, we were discussing, you know, is it okay to genetically modify humans while they're already doing it in China? So, you know, we are philosophically discussing more like what is acceptable, what is not, while already a lot of things are happening. And I think that with the AI, with the AI we, it actually, what it brings, I mean, there's just a Time Magazine released a recent article with um, written by Yutkovsky, who is one of the leading people of general AI, where, you know, he says we should be deeper afraid, but it's, it's going to, you know, terminate us all more or less because they don't know what they're doing. And I think this is just to answer your question. This is actually now where we really have to, um, you know, uh, embrace what it means to be human because the teacher's role now becomes more about, you know, the human values. What does it mean to deeply be human? Because you can get all that knowledge. The AI is going to change a lot of things and it is changing a lot of things. And um, so I think it's a lot about, you know, really um, the, the questions I'm thinking is more about, you know, what, what makes us human? What are those human values that we need to play? And is it, you know, the universal have things we have? What the, does humanity mean? What, what does it all mean? Because, um, yeah, because this is really a, a game changer for how our society is built. So it's a perfect invitation to rethink a lot of these structures that we have right now, because as many of you already mentioned, they are obsolete with the, with a lot of these things. So um, that was just proof of that. I, I fully agree with your comment that 
you know, we have to go deeper into what does it all mean for us and how can we connect more to one another and um, some of the more older, ha- you know, traditions and all these things that we're also discussing this conference. There's just a lot of thoughts and I, I think it's, it's such an interesting discussion. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll jump in if I may. Uh, one of the things that's it's kind of slightly concerning me about is, is I, I can get the point um, of, of AI as, as, a, as a servant, AI as a tool. There are all sorts of things, I, not necessarily generative, AI, I, I, I can see real advantages in using for getting things organized in the background, a lot of sort of boring, repetitive work. Um, and I also can understand and see some potential for um, the, the kind of factual knowledge being transmitted that way, leaving space for different forms of, of, of pedagogic interaction between teachers and students. I can really see that as a as an advantage. You know, why does some why does you know anyone have to stand up and go through what happened in 1883 or you know, you know whatever it's 1783, sorry, yeah, you know, re- regurgitate facts every year for 20 years was until you get your pension. Um but having said that, and going back to the conversation we had yesterday, for those who were there, there was there's a real danger of this sort of centralized knowledge repository. Um, as there is a danger for sort of Google dominating search and and then profiteering, you know, profiteering from it. Um, and I've done some work on on like you know how, for example, African. The voices of African intellectuals based in Africa just don't get heard in 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 the, in the north and the west because if it's in writ- written form, the books aren't actually ordered and put in American libraries. And if it's um, digital, then it, they're, they're coming from such small voices that they don't get picked. You know, they're number three hundred and seventy-two in the rankings when when the, the search order it goes by volume of production. So there are these issues which really. Um, which which worry me to what extent there's an edited and 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 culturally imposed version of of fact, but but but, but, but you know that's for danger. Um, I had the great honor of being mentored by a guy called Basil Davidson, who was the first in- English person to really realize that uh, there was a pre-colonial history of Africa, and the professor of history at Oxford University reviewed Basil's first book saying he was talking total rubbish. There was no history of Africa other than the history of the European in Africa. And yet you would think that the professor of history at Oxford stroke Harvard, you know, wherever, would be a kind of acknowledged expert, but this guy was talking biased nonsense. Um, and and in, in many, many much more subtle versions, uh, this, this becomes um relevant you know in 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 all sorts of facts and figures and and ideas and concepts so my uh, my argument then is if you're going to bring it into school how are you going to do it in a way that ensures a, a plurality of of perspectives um and 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 then how are you going to help the students uh, understand that, well, in fact, it is obviously the whole point of teaching to get them to understand how to take in a plurality of, of, of views and perspectives and then to work out what they want to do with from that. Uh, and I, I think the, the issue, you know, we, we've kind of knocked the issue of ownership and control out of this conversation. But the fact is that chat GPT is, you know, produced by a private company of which the biggest um biggest uh, shareholder i believe is microsoft and and uh, you know google has got its own version in in, the, in waiting in the wings and so on so it there it seems to me that there has to be some really strong conditionality about about regulation and diversity and and by diversity i don't just mean between microsoft and google but from all, you know all around the world global perspectives yeah, but let me give you let me give you a non-technological answer to what you're saying. You're you're talking about, you know, Google and all these, you know, controlling the knowledge base. 
but I'm thinking about textbooks right now in the United States, and I'm thinking about the state of Florida, where a governor and his particular uh, administration is saying what history is going to be, how it's going to be taught, and if anybody goes outside of the realm of that, particularly a teacher, they can lose their job. So, you know, it's an interesting question that you pose that from a technological point of view, here's all this stuff coming in. But then in, in reality right now, because of the political nature that is vibrant in the United States right now, we're, you know, we have textbook companies that are already doing that and they're not technological. We're having governors in certain states saying, Here's what you're going to teach, and here's how the textbooks are going to be written. So, yeah, it, it's a it's kind of an interesting question. And as I look at AI, maybe you know, if 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 you look at the positive side of it, and again, there's some people out there saying we should not call it artificial intelligence. What we should just call it is machine learning. And that's what's being generated in these giant computers. And the questions that you ask, then it pulls all that information together. You know, so it, it's something to think about, you know, as we explore how we gain knowledge. But then again, how do we allow for the development of the essence and potential and capability of every single kid, which then will impact the community? Yeah, this conference is about reimagination, reimagination of, of education, and and so this talk, which I assume is an extension of that, it's how can we use it? But if if this talk is about you know discernment or fear, uh, and and we're not imagining, then it's a it's a whole different context and it's a whole different uh, conference. So I'd like to imagine that um, instead of the product-oriented approach to education where we are wanting a child to come out with an output that we can grade, we can move education back into being something that the child owns for their self-development, which cannot be graded, cannot be assessed, and doesn't require an output. Because then we also move away from issues in plagiarism, even in tertiary education. Why are we worrying about plagiarism? You know, the only reason plagiarism matters is when we're in a competitive um, mode of education where everything becomes a commodity that has to be assessed on its value, the outputs. Whereas education is really about who we're becoming, right? So it's like um, the kid who's going to just use um, the AI to create this beautiful picture and just with any random prompt and they're not trying to shape it is really um, has been shaped by that need to kind of show off um, or, or just have an output that looks good. But the kid who's actually still in their creative mode in their empowered mode is not going to be satisfied with that. They want to shape the thing. They want to make it happen their way. So then it becomes a tool that they can actually use. So I think that this could be beautiful for fundamentally um, making it clear how much the way we've been doing education just doesn't make sense because now the AI can do all that stuff that we've previously mystified, which isn't so great actually, because people have been doing all these incredibly impressive outputs that everybody goes, ooh, and peer reviews without actually necessarily growing and becoming more of what they could be. So woohoo, if AI makes things redundant. But I think the one downside is um, as somebody put in the chat a moment ago, constant access to data and energy. And this is also where another issue of equity comes up because uh, we already experience this right now. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I don't have power right now. I had to make sure my phone was charged. I'm having to sit in a particular place to point my phone to be able to get the distant Wi-Fi. Whereas most of the participants in the conference are probably not in that position. So, you know, in the developing world, we're going to have, less access to these powerful tools. And what is that gonna do? So I think there's a whole lot of questions we need to interrogate there as well. But, you know, maybe maybe that's not a bad thing. I don't know. Yeah. I think if, if we 
take it more into the imagining aspect. If we try to think of the ideal, if we, the ideal version of school or learning with AI, how would that look like? Um, there was something that I wanted to say before already in the context of uh, imagining. I think it works really good. And the idea came also in a talk with Schmachtenberger, where he asked the question, where is the Einsteins of today? And uh, said, and Newton's, and why were those so exceptional? And what did they have in common? And what they had in common uh, was they all had the best tutors because it was an aristocratic uh, time frame and so on. And imagine AI in say five or 10 years, I mean, the, the development is crazy fast. What if we develop AI tutors and everyone had the chance to talk to Aristotle or Einstein or whoever, and then also have a human involved. So it's not just the AI tutor. And to uh, the point of now Google or whatever big tech company uh, being behind AI, that's not going to be like that forever. I mean, now the cost of training AI was a couple of million dollars, but I already heard of a model from Stanford, Alpaca, where the cost of training is around $600. And also the, the hardware you need is getting less and less. So, uh, experts are already talking about one or two years from now, you could have your own AI on a personal computer at home. So then it's not the big companies controlling those models anymore. But I think this aspect of the tutors ha and everyone having expert uh, uh, access to those is really interesting. Then you mentioned that it would be with tutors as well as some human person with them. Is that what you said? Why yeah, is the I think the human would be good also to have in pair with the with the tutor, with the AI tutor. Why is there a need the, the human isn't Einstein? I'm sorry? Why is there then also the need for the human if there's Einstein or Newton to talk to us? That's a hard one, but I think it's just AI and a human is different and and it will most likely be for a while, if not forever, like emotions and, and empathy and whatnot. Can you teach that to an AI? And uh, as long as it's in this development phase, early development phase, at least, I think it would be good to have this communication back and forth from AI to human. I, I want to bring something that I was thinking while Nicolas was speaking. Um, I... There's this alignment problem, which you guys will probably know, like how to ensure that like AI kind of shares the interests of the humans. And it seems to me that like, I, I don't know, this is like just all stuff that I was just thinking about, but but like, what if we, why, what if we like, also to the point of why would you need a human? Maybe you need a human to occasionally switch it off or like at least have some control about when it's being switched off so that like an AI has a sense of finitude even like I I'm just thinking that an AI can never be like a human because humans are finite and we have a sense of our own mortality and an AI does not have that unless we give it that and I, I somehow think that like you know having humans somehow perhaps control in a fashion when these things switch off my as well as many many other things like whatever but like i was just thinking that maybe a role for humans is like to somehow 
instill the AI with a sense, like, like trying to make it sort of more conscious in a way, but like at the very least to try to bring it closer to human in that particular sense of like, you know, try to think like a human and a human has consciousness and a big part of consciousness is like a, a sense of self and a sense of finitude. And I don't know, like some, that's just something I was thinking about. And I was also like wondering, you know, maybe we each have our own little personalized AI tutor that we walk around with and like it sort of knows where we are. And like it sort of brings us knowledge from the world, like that it's sort of at an appropriate level for us or something, and maybe a little bit, a tiny little bit, bit, like higher level than where we are, but like we still have control over. But we at least can, you know, choose to switch it off or at least affect it in some way somehow, so that we, you know, we don't completely rely on it. Or I don't know. I don't. I I, <laughs> I guess I lost my track of thought. But like I I think there's a point where we we. Yeah, we 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 need to be able to control these things, like when they're on, when they're off, somehow for for many reasons. I don't know. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. No worries. I would I would like to answer why we need a human. So my research for the past uh, maybe seven years is on social emotional learning, uh, based on uh, cultural dynamism. Yeah. Especially here in Asia, uh, using you know so our social on cultural dynamism, just based on cultural context uh, for social emotional learning. And so when AI, AI came out, you know that that was one of my biggest concerns. Was like, okay, can it teach us everything that we need? Like, can it replicate our social emotional connection? Well, the, and then so I play with it. I play with it as much as I can. And then I came out of the original JavaSoft team, the Sun Lab in Silicon Valley. So uh, artificial intelligence has been around for a long time. I mean, just now in an application that you can access. But certain, uh, most of its theory has been around for, 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 for a couple of decades or longer maybe. And um, yeah, and there's no way it can replace a human. And I think that once AI re takes over the mundane, the curriculum, the stuff that we, that we shouldn't even put, and this is why we're here at this conference, is so our children wouldn't be put through the, the regimen of these antiquated curriculum that we're still using, 10-year-old uh, textbook. I don't, you know, in technology, six-month-old textbook is gone in technology. So to us using, you know, uh, textbook that are 10-year-old, it's, it's, it's just crazy. So to me, AI will not be able to replace that. And, and it's going to give us or our next generation or the children another level of not having to worry about the mundane, analytical, logical uh, uh, information. And it's going to allow us to focus them on what I think, you know, uh, we are probably only using 10% of our creativity or social emotional connection, you know, and, and most of us are you know, are threatened because, yeah, we, we, we've we been trained and conditioned to think like a robot, to think, you know, analytical, to think logical, and especially in Asia. I mean, we want all want our kids to be, math, you know, mathematicians or we want our kids to be doctors. And, you know, those things are going to be gone because, like I said, AI can give us that information. So it's going to force this workforce to so that way we can sustain as a human to be more human to be in the context that i think that we are the most have the most power the most dynamics as being human which is our creativity and our imagination and so i think it i think it's it, it's, it's going to be a, a wonderful possibility ahead of us with ai so how do you see it practically or have you thought of that? How, how how does a classroom look like? Or not even how does learning look like? How does the education look like if we introduce AI into it? I, well, let's just say Okay, go ahead. No, you go, John. Yeah, I I put in the chat an interesting book called, you know, AI 2041. And it actually has a chapter. It's written by an AI. Um, entrepreneur who's in China now, was educated at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and 
it has these 10 scenarios and one is education. And what's interesting about it in terms of the education side of it is that kids will have cognitive tutors and they will have avatars that are based upon their personality, et cetera. So, and, and that the schooling process will be, you know, one where, where it's more collaborative processes where the interest of a child will be developed in relationship to the cognitive tutor. Now, what, what I think is interesting about that, and obviously you think about where our images of technology are coming from right now, you know, I think back to movies like, remember Frankenstein? So that was a fear of, of technology. Then um, we have, as, as I'm watching all this, I say to my friends, well, AI is almost, our danger point is Skynet. And those of you who watch the Terminator movies understand what Skynet was and what, what happened there. So, so we have that. But then you have movies like She, you have movies like um, uh, Deus, or what is it, Deus Maxima or whatever, or uh, Ex Maxima, where robots begin to take over, you know, and interact act with us. You have Westworld. You, so my point, and then you have Star Trek and you have the good AI, which is data. So, yeah. so what, I'm, what, what I'm getting at is, is that where our images come from, a lot of times are external to the types of media that, that we're, you know, we're looking at and it does stimulate. But if you talk to kids, you know, so, so we're doing a lot of work, work with kids to getting them to reimagine what learning needs to be in the future. And now this AI is dropped into that. It's going to be interesting over the next year or so to see what they begin to envision it to be. So I think one of the questions is, and if you're an educator, because, you know, I work with, you know, with kids, I work with adults in terms of that, is we need to have conversation to allow kids to let us see what their images are because they're the ones that are gonna create their future with this stuff, not us. And I think that's important to understand that we should just be nurturing environments that allow them to, to manifest their own futures, which can be individually and they can be collectively. I want to pick up on what you're saying there, but I want to take it further because I work in self-directed education. So we're already in a space where things are very different. And, you know, one of the things that led me here was getting out of the mindset of kids shaping their future. In our form of education, kids are shaping their present. We don't need kids to vision what education is going to look like. We can ask them today, what do you want your education to be today? And those kids are already playing with GPT. They already know how to fit it into their education. There's no question. It's happening right now. I'm watching our teens do lovely things with it. So I think, I think we, we get very, very stuck in this idea of, of having to create education and then give it to kids. But kids create their education on their own. No. Not on their own. But interactively in, you know, in environments that we can support. But our present structure in the United States, the educational system generates a mindset in kids that all they think about is learning, is getting the right answer on a test. I don't care what anyone says, that, that's it. You know, so when you look at schools outside of the traditional public educational structure in the United States, yeah, there, there, there's one school in Boise, Idaho called One Stone School that's run by the kids. Three quarters of, three quarters of the kids, and these are high school and middle school kids, are on the board of directors, and the adults who are on there are there to nurture their development of their leadership, but the kids make all the decisions, the kids make all the curricular decisions, et cetera. So these schools are neat ideas of, you know, e exemplars of where we can go, but the basic structure of American school system, and I think it's probably true in England, I think it's true in China and all of these, is that it is based upon 
the idea that the structure shapes the behavior of kids because we're going to nurture them or not nurture them. We're going to create them in the image that we want them to be in the future. We're not worried about their future. We're creating it for them. John, mm -hmm. does that paradigm, like the school that you just, I'm very like interested in this, like does it function? Like, can you say anything about that? Because I'm sort of curious, you know, these kids, they like have families and like, you know, they are, they model behavior from adults. And one thing I, I wonder is like, as adults, like we humans, do we act out values that are good for us in general? And like, if we don't pass on, you know, a certain set of values to our kids and then they start, you know, making up their own sort of education, you know, does that work? <laughs> like, I'm just curious. I mean, I know like in many ways, kids are wiser than their parents. And I, of course that's true, but like, I'm just curious how this like works in practice. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, this school's been in, in running for seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go out to onestone.org, you'll, you'll see what the school is. But it's what one couple of the teachers who are now in that school came out of the school High Tech High in San Diego. So if you ever saw the movie Most Likely to Succeed, which was a very unique school that developed because of Qualcomm at that time, did not have people. And so they brought this guy from, from Boston in who was a very innovative person and very interesting school there. So if you really wanna see some interesting schools, most likely to succeed is a great movie and yeah. go out to the one stone and you'll see what, what that, yeah, it's, it's giving agency to kids but it has adults helping to nurture that agency. That's the point. It, it, it's not, you know, if in England we had Summerhill, right? And Summerhill's still running. Yeah, I mean, A.S. Neal's Summerhill back in the 60s. Kids ran that school. So it's possible. But the problem is our major structure of schooling, particularly in the United States, is there. And the problem why it's hard to reimagine it we're all products of that system. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, the, being at this conference and I've asked so many people about understanding what it's like to be a child. And so we have, we have this context of how we were taught with how children are. But if you look at research out there, like the post-human child, how the, 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 you know, a lot of this research come out, what, what, what is really a child who wasn't conditioned by, like we were conditioned you know, uh, program at, at the moment we were born, slapping us in the ass, you know, uh, and waking up to a world like that, you know. Uh, yeah, if, if you relook at the post-human uh, uh, child, then you'll see, okay, if that's the possibility of the child, then yeah, they, they can manage, you know. They, they came to this world intact <laughs> with knowledge, uh, probably through the generation of DNAs uh, you know, from 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 their fathers and mothers down the line. You know, and they from their ancestors here in Asia, ancestry is everything. So, uh, you know, because that's who we are. That's who we we are lineage of. So, you know, I, I think as a, as a educator, we must read into uh, and and look at the post human child uh, uh, theories and 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 research to to really see who are we really dealing with. Not just a system that been that we've been conditioned or we've been taught how how they're supposed to be. Yeah, I just saw the time that we're actually ten minutes over, um, <laughs> but it's uh, it's lovely to, to hear to hear everything, and um, I personally learned a lot from all of you. So thank you for that. Um, I want to just summarize a little bit of the talk. I want I. I Whoever was here at the beginning and still has what they wrote and <laughs> as their thoughts and questions, you could take a look at that and see if uh, anything of what we, we spoke about through the discussion uh, affected it or or even um, had it made it that you see it more based on the, the discussion that we have. But from what I gather, uh, it really is, I think, a step in the in the right direction. Like it's, it'll definitely rattle things up. I think we all can agree on that. Um, that it it will really highlight the things that can 
and hopefully will very soon change. The question is in what direction and where it will go. Um, and I think that's something we can discuss on for hours. I think each person has their own ideas. Um, so hopefully we'll find it. We, we could find a time after. I don't know. I'm not sure what the how people can stay connected after, but maybe we can keep the conversation going. Um, yeah. Is there any final thoughts? Someone wants to. Anyone that hasn't spoken as much wants to. If not, then we'll close it. And I wish you all a great uh, morning, evening, night, each person their own thing. Hey, again, thanks for you. facilitating. Of you did course. a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't yeah. do much. This is a, w a wicked crew to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great talk. Thank you. Yeah, it was good. Could go, could go on forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so.